Good afternoon, Middletown. My name is uh, Norman Patterson, and I come from Simsbury, Connecticut. And I'm here to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. <laughs> and I just trust that God will bring people by who need to hear this message. And I'm going to preach the greatest sermon that I've ever preached in all my life. And I'm going to wait for this ambulance to go by. Because it's pretty noisy. It's going for a reason because somebody's in distress. Oh, thank you. They shut it off. So I'm going to start preaching the greatest sermon of my life. Oh, he started up again. There we go. <clears throat> and it's based on John 3.16, probably the most known scripture in all the Bible. <clears throat> so first I'm going to begin by, by reading it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. That is probably the best known scripture in all the world <coughs> and of all Christendom. Oftentimes you see that between the goalposts in a football game. Invariably somebody will hold up John 3.16 for people to see and hopefully they'll go look it up. So John 3.16 starts out with the word for. And the word for means that there's a conclusion there. There's a reason that it's there. Whenever you see for or therefore, you always have to ask yourself, what is it, what is it there for? Well, look, John 3.16 starts out for God. And the Bible talks about God. You see, you could find out about God just looking at creation. How are you doing today, sir? Ma'am. Ma'am? Oh, good. Sorry about that. Um, so we could figure out that there is a God as we look into the creation. Boy, that was a mistake. Sorry. <laughs> look like a guy. I'm sorry. Uh, you can't tell these days. And I'll just have to be careful. Um, we can look out in creation... <laughs> and see that there is a God. I mean, all you have to do is look around and just even look. And I talk about it. I'm looking right up at the sun. And where did that sun come from? And why does it hang up there in the sky? Well, the reason is, is because God has placed it up into the sky. The Bible says that in the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. You see, the Bible says that there is a creator of the universe. So when the Bible says, for God, when it mentions the name of God, he's not talking about, the Bible's not talking about just any God. Because there are not many gods. There is only one God. How are you doing today, sir? There's only one God that has created the universe <clears throat> and while we can look into creation and see that there is a God it is only through the revelation of the Bible that we could see who this God is it's only through special revelation that we have the particulars of who this God is that created the universe in fact it tells us that God created the universe throughout the whole pages of scripture and the God, when it says for God, the word God <coughs> means many things to many people. But ultimately speaking, the word God is not just some generic term that you apply to most anything. The word God in English, Dios in Spanish, Yahweh in Hebrew, Kyrios, Lord, in Greek, 
when it uses the word God, it is referring to a particular person. The person. And it tells us what this person is like. The person of God is a holy God. So God is holy. God is pure. God is light. So when you look at Eastern religions, they try to tell you that God is kind of good and kind of bad. But that's not the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible says that he is holy, which means that there's no darkness in this God who created heaven and earth. That this God is completely good. That this God has never sinned and cannot tolerate sin. <clears throat> so when John 3.16 talks about God, it's a particular God that has revealed himself in the pages of the Bible. And then it tells us something more <coughs> about this God. It tells us that this God so loved the world. So loved the world. Because that's the nature of the God of the Bible. In fact, the Bible says that God is love. So if you want to know and understand the essence of the God of the Bible, then you need to know that the essence of God is that He is love. <clears throat> that doesn't mean that wherever there's love, there's God, because there's all kinds of people that are using the word love, but the word love is not a godly form of love. It does not partake of the divine nature of the one and only Trinitarian God of the Scriptures. And I meant to say that <coughs> when it talks about the God who loves, the Bible reveals that this God <coughs> is a God of unity and complexity. And what that means is that God is one being. <coughs> Pardon me. Christians do not believe in three gods. Biblical Christianity believes in only one God. But biblical Christianity also believes that this one God is has revealed himself in three persons. And specifically, the three persons of the Trinity is not the creator, redeemer, and sanctifier of the liberal theology that they try to pass off as the Trinity. That's not the biblical Trinity. That's not the Trinity of the Bible. The Trinity of the Bible has revealed himself as one being. So Christianity is monotheistic, but Christianity has revealed himself as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. How are you doing, ma'am? I'm sorry about this calling you with your short hair. I mistake yeah. you. I have Bibles. Um, do you speak Spanish? I have the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John is wonderful. And this, if you like theology, this is just a great primer. It was written back in, um, gosh, six, 1747. Uh, 1647. Really? Yeah, mm. Westminster Confession. Have you ever heard of it? No. No? Now, back, um, the king back in England got all the, the pastors together and said, we want a statement of faith. And so they hashed it out for about a year. So, that's a good prime of theology. Thank you. You're very welcome. Have God bless day. you. You God too. <coughs> so this God has revealed himself as one being, but as three persons. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so we have unity and complexity. And it really is the Trinity of God really can answer all the great philosophical questions that you will find in the philosophy department. And one of those questions is, how could you have the one and the many? How could you have universals, but then also have particulars? How could you have one color white of light and then all the colors of the rainbow? The only way that that could be explained and all the mysteries of unity and diversity is through the God of the Bible. In fact, the word university comes from those two words. 
Una mean one and versity in many. And so the God of the Bible is a God that has unity in his being, but then three persons in who he is. And so this is the God <coughs> particularly that I'm talking about. And then nature of this Trinitarian monotheistic God of biblical Christianity is the love that he has. <coughs> And it's the nature of God. And it starts out, for God, for God so loved the world. You see, that's so important because if God didn't love the world, he would have been right and good and judge, justice and righteous to just send this world completely to hell. God had to love the world. The nature of God was to, love, to, to create a creation <coughs> in the pinnacle of his creation was in Adam and Eve made in his image in their original state and God loved them so much that he gave them a law and the law of God says not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil but what happened if you've ever read Genesis chapter 3 we can see what happened there what happened there was that God said, Do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And what did Adam and Eve do? Who knows how long it was. I think it was relatively soon that Eve was hanging around the tree. <coughs> and Satan came along and questioned God's word. Did God really say? And so... She looked at the fruit and saw that it was good, would taste good, would make her wise. I can't remember what the other thing is that, that Satan said to her. And so she took and ate of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then she gave it to Adam. And he should have been the steward and protecting his wife. And instead of protecting his wife, he listened to her in the deception that she was under and he ate of the fruit. And so at that point, human beings became enemies of God. We became enemies of God. We became estranged from God. We became apart from God. That there's no possible way as soon as Adam ate of that tree, God had warned them that the day that you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that you will surely die. And that's exactly what happened that day when Adam ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, both he and Eve died. They didn't die immediately in hell. They still had physical life, but they died spiritually speaking. And so from that time forward, all the children of Adam and Eve have been in enmity with God and are enemies of God. <coughs> and there's nothing in humanity that would ever seek out to look for God. You see, we hate God. We don't want Him. You know, it's no surprise that they threw prayer out of the schools. That's no surprise. Why would anybody be surprised at that? Because human beings, if we had our way, we would throw God out of everything. That's what we've done. We've thrown God out of our, out of our sexuality. We've thrown God out of our entertainment. We've thrown God out of our schools. We've thrown God out of the universities. We've thrown God out of virtually every sphere of life that there is because that's humanity. We hate God initially. That's our nature. We're God-haters. And so if God left us, if God did not love the world, we would be left in the place of darkness, of sin, of hate, of enmity with God. But John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world. It was God that had to take the initiative to come to this world. God had to take the initiative because we could not and would not take the initiative to go looking for God. <coughs> In fact, the first thing that we see God doing after they sinned against Him, they were hiding and they were ashamed because they were naked that's humanity. We don't want God, so we hide from God. 
And so Genesis chapter 3 says that this God was walking in the cool of the day. I don't think that's a very good translation of the Hebrew. And that God was walking in the day and he called out to Adam and Eve, where are you? Where are you, Adam? And that's the nature of God. That we see, for God so loved the world, in John 3.16, because it is an active verb of past tense. It is God, it's not passive, God so loved the world. God took the initiative, it is an active verb that God did in the past. He loved, he so loved the world. Without this God coming into this world, <coughs> without this God taking the initiative, without God expressing His love for us, then we would be left in hell. And so John 3.16 has some very deep theology here. For the God of the Bible so initiated relationship with human beings he loved the world. And the world that they're talking about is this fallen creation. Because when Adam and Eve sinned, all of creation was affected by it. That's why we have disease. That's why we have earthquakes in Turkey and Syria. Because we have a fallen creation. And when Adam sinned, the consequences was not only sin for himself. It was sin. It was death for not only it was death for his wife was also death for all his children. And it was death for every creature in all of creation. I believe that the implications of the fall, the fact that the fall, the world, it says, the creation, is groaning, waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. I believe that all of creation is groaning for this. <clears throat> this is what it means by the world all of creation <coughs> because when Adam sinned when Adam sinned all of creation was affected from the tiniest tiniest cell tiniest whatever there is that makes it up if it's Adam's who knows what it is but God when Adam fell all of creation he brought all, all creation into a place of suffering. And so we have suffering on every level. We have death. We have disease. We have destruction. We have earthquakes. We have too much sun. We have not enough rain. We have not enough sun. And we have too much rain because this world has disobeyed God. And so when God called Adam and God loved the world, the intent of God was not just to save Adam and Eve. His intent was also to save all of creation because all of creation is groaning in this world. That's why we have death. That's why we have disease. That's why we have destruction. That's why we have bad people doing bad things and lions ripping the throats out of antelopes and all the rest of the stuff that happens in this world. That's because of Adam's sin. And if God did not make the initiative, <coughs> pardon me, to love this world, this world would just absolutely self-destruct. And the fact is, is that God's love, before I even get to giving His only begotten Son, God's love is that the world is not as wicked and evil as it could be. Human beings are not as wicked and evil as, it could, as they could be. You know, why is it that even thieves have some form of honor and know when somebody's stealing from them? Why is it that people are not just constantly shooting each other and killing each other? Well, the reason is because of the restraining love of God. The restraining love, the common grace <coughs> that God has given to this world. So the love of God goes even beyond, though the greatest expression of the love of God is in the person and work of Jesus Christ, 
love of God is seen in His restraining grace and His common grace, how He pours out His love for people that we have food, that we have health, that we have homes, that I can walk, that I can see, that I can hear, that I can talk, that you can too. Or you could do most of those things. And the reason that's so glorious <coughs> is because that's the love of God upon a creation and upon the creation of mankind that deserves nothing, nothing but His absolute wrath. You see, I'll go back to God who is absolutely holy and absolutely just. This God is the God who so loved the world. And it's so good that the Bible has the nature of that reveals to us that God is love. Because if God was not love after the creation, He would have sent Adam and all, all His children right to hell. But God has restrained His wrath upon us and has shown His love to, or, towards this world. And so John 3.16 goes on that God, <coughs> the God of the Bible, initiated the love that He has for the world, this creation, particularly mankind, that He gave, and let me stop there, that He gave. That's the expression of the love of God. That God gave. That, again, is the nature of love, is to give. God doesn't have to give us anything. And yet, out of His nature of love, He gives. And I just went through all the things that God gives us, all the good. All good and perfect gifts comes from the Father of lights. That's what it says in the book of John, uh, James, chapter 1. But the particular giving that this scripture talks about, <clears throat> it says that He gave His only begotten Son. So I'm going to take some time and expound upon that. God gave. That word gave is so packed with rich, covenantal, biblical theology that I could spend years talking about the nature of God's gift. Who is it that God gave? <clears throat> His. Which is a possessive pronoun. The possessive pronoun His is referring to somebody. And so God <coughs> this one self-existing holy Trinitarian God gave His only begotten Son. Who is the only begotten Son? What does that mean? It means that the second person of the Trinity, I've already talked that God is one being, but He has revealed Himself in complexity as the Father and the Son in the Holy Spirit. So when this verse talks about God giving His only begotten Son, we're talking particularly about the second person of the Holy Trinity. Pardon me. His only begotten Son. You see, Jesus, when somebody is begotten, like I have a son, and I have begot my son, I have begotten a son, who is just like me. He has the same nature as me. I beget a son, I beget children, and they are like me. I beget somebody of my own kind and my own nature. And so when God so gave His only begotten Son, <coughs> what that is saying is that the second person of the Holy Trinity is of the same nature in the same substance as God. So when we talk about Jesus Christ, the second person of the Holy Trinity, we are talking about God, who has the very nature, the very substance, the very glory. All that God is, is Jesus Christ. All that God is, all you could say about God, you could say about the second person of the Holy Trinity. <clears throat> and one of the great blessings that we have is that this only begotten Son eternally 
begotten is the way uh, one of the creeds says it, eternally begotten. There was never a time when Jesus Christ did not exist. Jesus Christ has existed always because he is God and he is the second person of the Trinity. And one of the attributes of God is etern eternality. God is infinite and has always existed. There was never a time when God did not exist. And so the God in John 3.16, the only begotten Son, is not the God of the Jehovah Witnesses. The Jesus of the Jehovah Witnesses is a false God. Well, it's not a God. They think it's an angel. They think it's some sort of archangel that came into this world. But the Bible is very clear that the second person of the Holy Trinity is God incarnate. The only begotten, eternally begotten Son of God. But the beauty of this verse <coughs> is that it is this person, this second person of the Holy Trinity. The Bible tells us that he became incarnate. And that's a word in the middle of the word incarnation is the word C-A-R-N, which means flesh. And so God enfleshed himself in the creation, not the creation, he, he enfleshed himself in the person of Jesus Christ. And when Jesus Christ came into this world, not only was he the second person of the Holy Trinity with the nature of God, very nature of God, he also had and took upon himself the nature of mankind. And so when John talks about that he gave his only begotten Son, what we're talking about here is the God-man. That's how Anselm said it, the, the uh, theologian from many years ago. He talks about Jesus Christ being the God-man. Jesus Christ being one person with two natures. The nature of God and the nature of humanity. And this is the God that God gave in John 3.16. <clears throat> he was certainly born of a woman. He had human nature. But the difference between you and I is that God had a perfect, Jesus Christ had a perfect human nature. That's something that we have not seen since Adam walked on the face of the earth. Who knows how long he had that perfect human nature, but that human nature became corrupt because of his sin and rebellion against God, and now he's under the wrath of God. But Jesus Christ had the nature of man. <coughs> And as such, he became a representative of all humanity. All humanity. So Jesus Christ, well, Adam was the first representative of all humanity. He was our federal head. And if you're not in Jesus Christ, you're still under the federal headship of the first Adam. And if you're under the federal headship of the first Adam, that means that you are under the curse that Adam is under apart from God. And Jesus Christ as the representative of all humankind means that He can represent us as the second Adam. And Jesus Christ is the federal head of all of those who believe in Him. And so John 3.16 says, God, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That's what the Bible is talking about here. <coughs> Now when it talks about gave, let's go back to the word gave. The word gave here means, as we look at it in the context of the rest of Scripture, when God gave Jesus, He gave Him as a sacrifice. We see that God's gift to us was when Jesus Christ died on the cross. I mean, all of Jesus Christ's life was, was a sacrifice when God came into this world in human form that was a sacrifice to leave his throne of glory that he had as the king of the universe as the second person of the holy trinity <clears throat> and so jesus christ humbled himself it says in philippians chapter 2 he humbled himself he became incarnate god almighty became a man came walked on the face of this earth 
And so when it says that God so loved the world that he gave, it means that he sacrificed Jesus Christ on the cross. That's the only way that we could be saved. And so the ultimate way that we see the love of God manifested in this world is through the, the, uh, <coughs> the, the person and work and birth and life and obedience and death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ. But the giving here, let's never stop. Let's never stop. Um, let's, let's make sure we stop and take a look at the cross of Jesus Christ. Because it is in the cross of Jesus Christ that we see the love of God has been manifest into this world. The love of God is a particular, particular action that we see. The ultimate sacrifice that God has given us. God didn't have to do this, but he gave his son, Jesus Christ, who went to the cross. And the cross is a very brutal, brutal instrument of torture. <clears throat> the Roman Empire perfected torture. <coughs> It truly did. And if you've ever taken time to study the dynamics of the torture of the cross, you will learn just how brutal that torture was. Jesus Christ did not have to go to the cross. He could have just walked right by. He could have just kept going. But because Jesus Christ is God and the nature of God, is to give, Jesus Christ gave his life in obedience to the Father. You see, there is no way for us to be made right with God apart from the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That's what makes biblical Christianity different than any other religion in the face of the earth. Biblical Christianity is different. And the reason that it's different is that it has been initiated by God himself. All other religions are man-centered, trying to work our way to heaven. But biblical Christianity is that God is the one who came to us and initiated salvation. That's what biblical Christianity is all about. The rest of our salvation is based upon human works. Study every other religion. Study every other religion. It's based upon man's work in some way. But biblical Christianity is based upon the sacrifice that God has given to us in the person of Jesus Christ going to the cross. It is only through the cross of Christ that we could have salvation. How are you doing? Doing good. How are you? Good. Doing good. Preaching the gospel. Love that. All right. Thank you. And so God <clears throat> gave a sacrifice, His only begotten Son, who is the best that God, God could ever give. <coughs> and Jesus was a pure and holy sacrifice. When you look at the life of Jesus Christ and the person of Jesus Christ, he was absolutely perfect in every way. He was perfect physically. He was perfect um, in his obedience. He was perfect in, in um, his holiness. He was absolutely perfect when he finally came into this world. He finally brought about the perfection that God would have for Jesus Christ when he became incarnated and fleshed into this world. That is the one that God has given. <clears throat> and Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ went willingly to that instrument of torture, willingly, out of obedience to the Father. <clears throat> That's what it means for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Oh, I wish I could preach this from the pulpit and churches. There's so many churches that they need to hear this. Even Christians that have been Christians for decades. You need to hear again the message of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, the beauty of Jesus Christ, the beauty of Jesus Christ as the Son of God, the Son of God come into this world to take away the sins. <clears throat> God gave His only begotten Son as a substitute for our sins. You see, 
I talked at the beginning how God is holy. And because God is holy, we cannot be in His presence. How you doing? We cannot come into the presence of God. You don't have to pay on Sundays. Thank you. You're welcome. We cannot come into the presence of God because of His absolute holiness that he, of who He is. And the just person that God is, that all sin must be atoned for, must be paid for. And so, that's the giving. It's a propitiation. It's a propitiation. Bet you didn't hear that word this morning in your sermon if you went to church. Propitiation means the atoning sacrifice that turns away the wrath of God. And oh my goodness, Christians today, they're so afraid to talk about the wrath of God because they're so afraid of hurting anybody's feelings. We got a bunch of babies in biblical Christianity, not biblical Christianity, in churchianity in our churches today. And so then if you tell them that unless they repent and turn to Jesus Christ, that they're under the wrath of God, gosh, if I was in a church and the pastor proclaimed that, I would say, Amen, brother. Keep preaching it. Because if I'm not in Jesus Christ, I'm under the wrath of God. The punishment of sin is death. The punishment of sin is eternal death. And so God, we're under God's wrath unless we're in Jesus Christ. Do you believe that, my friends? Do you believe in Jesus Christ? Are you good? I'm glad to hear that. Always trust in Jesus alone for your salvation. Jesus Christ is the propitiatory sacrifice for our sins. <clears throat> in other words, He is the sacrifice that, that has absorbed, taken the wrath of God that the sin deserves. And Jesus Christ not only turns away, He turns away the wrath of God from all those who are in Him, but the turning away means that that wrath went, in, went somewhere. And the wrath of God, where did it go? It went upon the person of Jesus Christ. The full weight, the full wrath of God. All, God did not restrain Himself like I talked earlier, God restrains Himself. Restrains that we just don't immediately go to hell. And when Jesus Christ was on the cross, the full weight, the full fury of God, <coughs> the punishment that sin deserves was visited upon Jesus Christ, the second person of the Holy Trinity, the God-man. And so when you take a look at the cross of Jesus Christ, you see a propitiation, a sacrifice that turns away the wrath of God. <clears throat> and that doesn't mean that God somehow has changed His mind about sin and sinners. That's not true at all. Some people say you got to, you know, you got to, you know, love the sinner and hate the sin. Well, I can tell you what, when a sinner goes to hell, it's not going to be the sin that goes to hell. It's going to be the sinner that goes to hell. And if you really believe what the Bible says, then you go out in the streets too and start preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the atoning sacrifice that turns away the wrath of God. I mean, I even have it on the side of my van. It talks about how God turns away His wrath because of Jesus Christ. You know, it's okay to talk about the wrath of God. It's okay to talk about that. <clears throat> That's what it means. The rock of ages cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. It's an imagery of Moses seeing, wanting to see God. And God said, you can't see my face, but I'll show you my afterburn. I'll show you my back. And so he put Moses in the cleft of the rock because if Moses saw God, he would immediately die at that moment for all eternity because God is so awesome and God is so holy. And when Jesus Christ went to the cross, he took the wrath of God that you and I deserve for our sin. But if you're not in Jesus Christ, that wrath of God is still there. It's still there. 
And so that if you're not in Christ, then when you die and go before God, that means <coughs> that the wrath of God, the punishment that He has ordained within Himself in the counsel of His own will and the nature of His character as a holy and just God will be still there upon sinners. You know, there's a, there's a, there's a soft universalism that has penetrated into the modern church today. And that soft universalism that has come into the church today is this idea that when Jesus Christ took the wrath of God on the cross, that somehow God has stopped being angry about sin. And that's just not true. We are not universalists. And so when we say to sinners that you're under the wrath of God, that wrath still is there. And so anybody that wants to try to tell you that because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, that the wrath of God has been appeased towards all sin, towards all sinners, that's a false theology. And I'm not preaching false theology, I'm preaching biblical theology. And biblical theology says that the wrath of God was poured upon Jesus Christ for all who believe in Jesus Christ. And if you're not in Christ, you're under the wrath of God. That's a very serious thing. How you doing today, sir? Pretty good, man. Been baptized long for Milltown and Harvard. You have? Wonderful. Catholic, Southern Baptist, and all Dominus okay. Iglesias. Okay. So you have faith in Jesus Christ. Yeah. Because I'm Catholic, talking about... Southern Baptist, and all that. No, Catholic. Latino. Yeah. And all that matters is that you have Holy that Jesus. faith in Jesus Christ. French, and so forth. Mm-hmm. Yep, Catholicism and baptism is not going to save you. It's only in faith. It's, gonna, it's only faith in Jesus Christ. And you and have that James, faith? Catholic, and yeah. Southern Baptist, and so forth. Yep, yeah, but salvation comes in Christ. All Iglesias and Hartford, across from the church. Okay. And um, um, I, w I was trying to say the, the hospital. Okay. South End of Hartford. Okay. So I do have faith in the Lord. You have I don't faith in Jesus. In God, right? I believe in higher power. Well, the Bible says particularly. Something is protecting me. That's yeah, what I believe. Yeah. In. Something is protecting. Well, if you say you're saved, that car, means you gotta believe in Jesus Christ. So yeah, that's God's grace on you. But the 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 blessed. God of the Bible, there's no there's no just I don't higher power. In the Bible, I believe in preaching. Well, you know, if you don't believe in the Bible, this is all you can preach is that's, from the Bible. That's all you can preach. Else. It's written by God. The Bible claims. The Bible says in it's Second spiritual. Timothy. No, oh, the Bible says that this is the breathed word of God that God blood. has written it. No, this is this is fully the word of God. See, otherwise you're just believing in belief. No, but the no, Bible says particularly I believe. I believe that we must spiritual. believe in Jesus Christ. Particularly in Jesus. Now, well, Catholicism is not going to save you. And the only Southern way we're Baptist. saved, the only way we're and saved is Latino. yeah. The only way we're saved is through faith in Christ, well, and that's how we know. Believe in a higher power. Well, higher power is not going to save you. Not just that, but I believe in what you're saying. Well, what I'm I've saying been here saved from car accidents yeah. and so forth. But you, we need to be saved favor. from God through Jesus Christ. You see, I've already gave my faith into the Lord. Into Jesus Christ. Yeah, he's but you were faith. saying that you don't believe in the Bible and you just I believe in a higher power. I don't believe in the scripture from the Bible. Why not? Because it's written by man. No, it's not. The Bible claims it's written by God. Read it all through here. It says the word the of the Lord. contradicts himself. Where? In a lot of ways. Where? By different preachers. Where? I'm not, I don't get into that. You but just, you just I, believe that is a contradiction, but you can't name one. I, I don't get into it like Proverbs. I believe in 19 through 36, I'm a dog who returns into his own vomit. Okay. And I don't answer a fool in his own questions. Yeah. Because I become a fool. Right. And the Bible says that the God of the Bible is the only one true God. It's You're not just a higher power. You're right everything you say. Yeah. That's so, why I'm, more, I'm my own individual. Yeah. And we need to come to faith in Jesus Christ and that's what I'm calling people to do today. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah. I don't disagree with that, but yeah. I just want to say thank you. All right. Very good. Yes, Bye sir, my you. man. All right. Thank you. Yeah, you're Keep welcome. Doing what you're doing. I will. Trust in Jesus yeah. Christ alone for salvation. How you doing today? Good, how are you? Good. Um, yeah, Joseph. <coughs>
Yeah, that man is very confused. He doesn't believe in the Bible and he just believes in a higher power. Well, that's that's not the God of the Bible. You know, that man is not saved. There's no way that man is saved. So, you know, we, we must confess with our lips. We must confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the God of the Bible, not just some sort of higher power. You see, that's what I'm talking about, a soft universalism. A soft universalism would say that people could be saved in whatever religion that they're in. But that's not at all what the Bible says. We are not saved by the sincerity of our faith. We're only saved by the gift of faith that God gives us to trust in Jesus Christ alone for our salvation. And if we don't trust in God alone for in, in Jesus Christ alone for our salvation, then we do not we're not saved. How are you doing? We're still under the wrath of God because God is holy and in his holiness he will not overlook sin. No, this soft universalism that is in most churches. I heard it when I was the United Methodist pastor. I had other pastors who supposedly were, were uh, conservative evangelicals. And I remember one guy, he said to me that a sincere Buddhist can be saved. And that sincere Hindus and sincere Muslims, that everybody could come to whatever God they believe in. This is right out of the pit of hell. This is something that C.S. Lewis talked about in the last battle in the Chronicles of Narnia. He had what would be representative of a, of a person from Islam. He ends up in heaven and, and Aslan is the representative supposedly of Jesus Christ. And the, 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 is, the Muslim was saying, why was I here? He said, G Aslan said to him, because you were sincerely following me when you were following Allah. Well, that's not at all what the Bible says. The Bible is very, very clear that faith only comes through, I mean, salvation only comes through faith in Jesus Christ. And if a person is not in Christ, we're still under the wrath of God. The wrath of God is still there because God is still holy and God is still just. And so if you're going to be a universalist, then go ahead and be a universalist. I mean, you're wrong. It's heresy. It's not biblical, but at least be consistent. Jesus Christ removes the wrath of God the Father upon all who are in Christ, nobody else. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, it was not just some sort of general atonement. He particularly died for all those who would believe in Him in salvation. It was a perfect sacrifice, and that's why Jesus said, on the cross it is finished. All that needed to be done to accomplish the salvation for all that God intended to be saved, read John chapter 8, has been accomplished in the, the propitiation, the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. And so, if you're in Jesus Christ, you have nothing to fear. You have nothing to fear. You don't need to fear the wrath and anger of God towards sin, but then there should be a holy, holy reverence over that because Jesus Christ <coughs> became your sacrifice. And so there, that's what John Newton was talking about when he said, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. The amazing grace of John Newton, the author of Amazing Grace, was and who saved a wretch like me, John Newton, who was a slave trader, understood that he absolutely did not deserve forgiveness whatsoever. But the amazing grace is, is that God has given our, His Son, Jesus Christ. Ask me and I will pay for you. Yes, I will. Okay, sir. I am down and out. Okay. 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 I am down and out. Yep. Um, am I in the news? What's that? Am I in the news? No, no, no. Sometimes people come in and bother okay, me. I'm down now. Yeah, yeah. My brother was not you, but Are you pointed at me. Was, <laughs> no, but not you. I'm saying was my my uh, PE. Okay. What he did, oh, he sir, to me bad. was he said I don't want to be a PE anymore. Okay, I'm sorry to hear so that. So what happened, sir, is I have fucked up. 
Wow. Yeah. yeah. Matches over. So, yeah. therefore, I'm sorry please to hear pray that. for me. Lord, I pray for my brother here. First of all, that he would know Jesus. And second of all, Lord, that you would supply all he needs in this life. And I pray that justice would be served for what happened to him with his brother. But more than anything, Lord, I pray that his heart would be turned to know Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and so I'm talking about the propitiation, the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ that takes away the wrath of God upon all those who believe in Jesus Christ. But that wrath of God is still there. God has not changed His mind towards sin. And so when we stand before God, <coughs> after we die, if you're not in Jesus Christ, the wrath of God the Father remains. It's still there. Not for those who are in Jesus Christ. For those who are in Jesus Christ, we are shielded. We have a sacrifice. We are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, by His atoning death, by His sacrifice. I stand before God. I'll still be trembling in my shoes. But I'll say, only upon the blood of Jesus Christ. And if anybody's standing next to me and they're not in Jesus Christ, well, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So I'm out here warning people, warning people that we have this time in our lives to come to faith in God. We have this time in our life because after we die, there's no, there's no chance to make another decision. That's the truth. And you feel like you're young, you're, everything's great, but think about the 27,000 people in Turkey and Syria at a moment died. Terrible, terrible tragedy. We need to be right with God, and the only way to be right with God is through faith in Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and the promise of the Bible is, I'm going to continue in John 3.16, that whoever believes in the only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, whoever believes in Christ, whoever puts their hope, whoever puts their faith, whoever puts their trust in Jesus Christ, in Him. That's who He's talking about. Whosoever. And so, and so people will say, how could there be the elect? I thought that everybody has an opportunity. And that's exactly right. All human beings have an opportunity to see the existence of God. Every human being is without excuse. The law of God is written in our hearts. The law of God is written in the book. The law of God is written throughout all of creation. We are without excuse whatsoever. And so we cast the seed out into the world. And everybody that's hearing me on Facebook, everybody that's walking by, that's the whosoever. The, the, the call to salvation is a universal call. It is a universal call to all human beings. All human beings are called to follow and obey Jesus Christ. And when that happens, it's not an asking, it's not a begging. <coughs> when we go out and we preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, we go out and we command you. We command you to come to faith in Jesus Christ. We command you to repent of your sin. We command you to trust in Christ alone for our salvation. It's not somebody just pleading with you. God commands you to come to faith in Jesus Christ. Whosoever believes in Him, whosoever believes in Jesus Christ, that promise is an absolute promise. And today, if you have faith in Him, if you have belief in Him, you should not perish. So we have a universal call, but not a universal salvation. We have a universal call, but it is not a universal forgiveness that God <coughs> has done on the cross through Jesus Christ. Otherwise, what's the sense in going on and preaching? Who cares? That's why you'll never see a universalist, Unitarian, out on the streets preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because there's no need. Everybody will be saved. That's why you don't see Roman Catholics out on the streets because Roman Catholicism has the false teaching of purgatory. That someday you die 
And then you'll just have to burn off your sins for a couple thousand years. How are you guys doing? Ready to burn in hell. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> you say that now. Someday if you don't repent, you will be. And that's the truth. And I care enough about you. Do you go to Wesleyan? Do you know who John Wesley was? I bet you don't even know. See, he's, he's ready to burn in hell. That's not something to joke about, my friend. That's a very serious thing. And that, if you believe in Jesus Christ, you shall not perish. It's amazing to me that people would joke about hell. That's an amazing thing. The Bible says that whosoever believes in the only begotten Son of God should not perish. The word perish there is a very serious word. It means that if you're not in Jesus Christ, that you're going to go to hell. You're not going to hear that in the church, but that's what the Bible says. That if you believe in Him, you should not perish. You can have eternal life, everlasting life. But if you're not in Jesus Christ, you don't have eternal life. You're not going to find salvation in any other way, in any other name than the name of Jesus Christ, than in the person of Jesus Christ. <coughs> so I'm given the universal call. I'm given the universal call for a particular salvation for all those who God, by His love and His grace and His mercy, will give the gift of faith to. And I don't know who you are. I don't know who you are. But God does. And this is the means, by the preaching of the Word of God, that produces faith by the power of the Holy Spirit in the heart of a sinner. <clears throat> and when God uses the preaching of the Word, a miracle takes place. <clears throat> and that miracle is found at the end of John 3.16. That miracle says that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Everlasting life. And let's be clear about this. The everlasting life here is a particular phrase and understanding in the Bible. Every human being is going to live forever. Every soul that has been created, every zygote that has ever been conceived on the face of this earth from all time and all history is a living being that will live for all eternity. But the question here is what kind of everlasting life will you have? The everlasting life referred to in this verse here is talking about life that God gives. It's talking about the life that God regenerates into the broken, the fallen, the sinful, the hateful human heart. That's the everlasting life. <clears throat> Otherwise, we'll have everlasting death. We don't want everlasting death. We want to be with God forever. The only way to be with God forever is through faith in Jesus Christ. There's no other way. There's no other way that we can have it. And so, <laughs> I ask you today, living beings who are going to live forever and ever and ever and ever, where are you going to spend eternity? <clears throat> where are you going to spend eternity? It will either be in the presence of God by the merit of Jesus Christ, by the grace of Jesus Christ. It will be in the presence of God, in the love of God, because of the work that Jesus Christ has done on your behalf. The Bible talks about a forever. It talks about heaven. It talks that the human soul does last forever. Jesus talked, said to the thief on the cross, this day you will be with me in paradise. We do live forever as human beings, but the question is where? Where will you live for all eternity after you perish out of this earth? The Bible tells us the only way that we can live forever is through faith in Jesus. It's through our hope in Jesus Christ. So when God gives you life, it's eternal life. It's life in His presence. It's life in knowing Him. Because only in God do we have that life. Only through Jesus Christ can we come into God's presence. 
forever. That's what eternal life is all about. You see, we are eternal beings as human beings. We live forever. But the question is, where will you live forever? Will it be in heaven or will it be in hell? And that's a very serious question. And the only way that you could be made right with God is through Jesus Christ. And that's why I'm preaching out of John 3.16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. And so this day, sir, if you put your faith in Jesus and hope in Him for your salvation and trust in His sacrifice on your behalf, God will grant you forgiveness and He'll give you eternal life in Jesus Christ. That's a beautiful and powerful message, yes, isn't it? You're very welcome. Do you have faith in Christ? I hope you get a big audience. Yeah, I mean, it's sparse. Do you have faith in Christ? Do you have faith in Christ, my friend? Raise the Catholic. Okay. Well, that's not going to save you. So today, since today, you know, we're, 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 we're getting older. And we have to think about these things. I'm 60 years old. You're a little bit older than me, I suspect. Maybe not. And where will you spend eternity? And to trust in Jesus Christ. The Bible gives the answer. He gives that answer to trust in Him. That means that Jesus Christ died on your behalf on the cross. And when you trust in Him, it's not from taking the Eucharist like they tried to teach you in the Catholic Church. That's not it at all. It's because God puts faith in your heart, takes away your heart of stone, gives you the heart of flesh, and then He breathes His life into you and we live then forever. That's the gift. Thank you. And I hope that you come to faith in Christ, my friend. Yeah, I hope so too. And if there's any way I can help you in that, you let me know. I always keep this. Don't be nervous about it. I do this because sometimes people come and harass me, oh. you know. So I keep this for my own safety. Uh, I, I'm sure I am with you. Yeah. Do you? Uh, you know, I don't have a Gospel of John. I have. Okay. I have. I have a You do. Okay. Here's just a little booklet about life. You could take it. That's fine. That's fine. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. Do you mind if I pray for you? I'm going to pray for you. What's your first name? Pray for Walter. Okay, I'm going to pray for you. Lord, I pray for my, my friend here. I ask, Lord, that he would come to faith in Jesus Christ and he would trust alone in Jesus for his salvation and that today, Lord, that you'll do that work that only you can do. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you, sir. God bless you. <laughs> so the Bible talks about eternal life because we are beings who will live forever. And as I said just a few minutes ago, as soon as a human being is conceived, as soon as there's even the single cell of a human being, as I go, that that is a human being with an eternal soul that will live forever. And so today... Will you have faith in Jesus Christ? The Bible says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. Do you believe in that, sir? There's no other way to have salvation than through Jesus Christ. That, well, it's up to you. It's up to you. Well, you need to come to faith in Christ. You need to repent of your sin. You need to repent of your sins, sir. So I'm, uh, I'm done now. I've preached the Word of God here today. And I've called people to faith in Jesus Christ. And my hope and prayer is that people will come to faith in Jesus Christ. There's no other way. There's only one hope for life in our world. And that's faith in Jesus Christ. And I'd be glad to pray with you if you want prayer. I'd be glad to uh, talk to you about salvation. I'd be glad to help people come to that faith that can only come through Jesus Christ. And when you have that faith in Jesus Christ, a miracle happens. The miracle is that God transforms us. He pardons our sin. He adopts us as, our, as His sons and His daughters. And then He sanctifies us. He gives us the Holy Spirit. And it comes through faith 
It comes through hearing the Word of God. So, all right, I'm uh, done preaching here. Appreciate anybody that was praying for me. And, you know, the fruit is up to God. The obedience by the power of His Spirit is up to us and is up to me. But the fruit of what it is that I do um, is up to the work of God, whether a person, a sinner, comes to salvation or not in Jesus Christ. And so that's why I call people to repentance in Christ and to trust in Him alone for salvation. So I'm going to close up shop now down here and uh, I'll probably go someplace else. So to God be the glory. His word was proclaimed and His word was preached. To God be the glory. Amen.